you know, the consumption space, which is a theme we're going to take forward. Sapphire Foods is a stock on our radar. Good set of Q2 earnings, but this was on a low base. The company's margins have improved versus last year on the back of operating leverage and lower employee costs. But the EBITDA has declined sequentially because of raw material inflation and seasonality. Sanjay Purohit, who's the whole time director and group CEO of Sapphire Foods, joins us now to talk about that. Uh, Sanjay, thanks a lot for joining in. Can you just set the context of the interview by telling us how Q3 is shaping up so far and what kind of revenue growth are you penciling in for the full year? So, uh, first I'll quickly talk about quarter two because I heard you say it's on a low base. So, actually it wasn't on a low base. Okay. Quarter one was impacted, quarter, quarter one last year was impacted by COVID, but quarter two was largely without any disruption. Perhaps a few pockets like Maharashtra last year were under a bit of strain, but quarter two was as normal a year as possible. And therefore, 36% growth over last year uh, is a really strong performance. Uh, you have to also keep in mind that this quarter was potentially a very challenging quarter. One, from a KFC perspective, generally this quarter is soft because of the higher festival vegetarian sales, uh, sales days. And secondly, we are looking at inflation in the region of mid-teens. So we had to pay, play a fine balancing act in terms of pricing to ensure that transactions don't drop. So transactions in the QSR space is the equivalent of volume growth. And I'm really happy to say on both KFC as well as Pizza Hut, we have seen good transaction growth. So right. uh, <clears throat> quarter two uh, itself has been a really good quarter. Mm. As we go into quarter three, typically, um, uh, uh, you know, sales uh, improve because there are very few uh, vegetarian festival days. December itself is a strong month. Mm. And now right up to perhaps quarter one of next year, we see very few, um, you know, days when people turn vegetarian. This is important from a KFC perspective, also from Pizza Hut. All right. A uh, uh, non-vegetarian quarter coming up. <laughs> Uh, Sanjay, hi, good morning. Great to have you with us here. Uh, appreciate your good time. Good morning. Nice to be back on your show. Uh, great to have you. Uh, just a quick uh, point. I mean, you know, uh, the, the pe people always compare, both for Pizza Hut and uh, KFC, margins for you and margins for Devyani, uh, naturally, right? And uh, uh, the, the, the gap has narrowed quite a bit, especially for Pizza Hut. Uh, in the case of KFC, uh, the, the gap is still uh, some 350-odd basis points, 360-odd basis points. Could you give us some trajectory on how this will proceed? Where is, out of the two, uh, uh, wh where is there more room to improve margins? Because of, uh, due to operating efficiencies and other factors. Go on. So quickly, we've got to look at where we started from. So four or five years ago, both these brands had restaurant EBITDA margins in... Uh, the lower single digits, so 5 to 7%. Now you see KFC inching up to between 18 and 20% and Pizza Hut in the mid-teens. And this is what we had called out on both the brands, that as we, as we improve sales and as we drive a cost uh, optimization agenda, and as we get to smaller stores that are far more efficient, we will find our restaurant EBITDA numbers improving. It's especially true on Pizza Hut, because Pizza Hut, many people looked at us even perhaps a year ago and didn't believe the story that we were telling. The omni-channel model where dine-in, delivery, and takeaway, all three of them, all three channels come into play, this optimizes the use of an asset. And if you see, as we uh, progress, as we open new stores, the new stores on Pizza Hut deliver uh, mid to high teens margin, and our overall profile is, um, you know, will improve. Mm -hmm. So we've always said on KFC in the region of 20% restaurant margin is what we would be happy with, and then we drive a new store expansion quite strongly. On Pizza Hut, we moved from 10% last year to now 15%. Perhaps there is still opportunity to move this up. Our new stores that we have opened since uh, April 18 are in the region of mid to high teens, so better than the average brand. So I think 
um, KFC in this region, Pizza Hut, perhaps uh, there's opportunity to improve further. All right. Hi, Sanjay. Uh, Nigel on this side. You know, I put out a piece on uh, Sapphire as well, and I highlighted a couple of aspects why, uh, you know, the valuation wasn't as much as another listed peer. One of the factors were margins were a little bit lower. But as you're saying, you'll have put some levers in place and expecting things to improve on some part of your business. So for FY24, you know, in the cup, can we expect margins in excess of around 20%, point number one? And Sri Lanka was the other pain point. Are you seeing signs of revival out there? You'll have reduced your exposure quite drastically out there. But are things now on the mend? So... I won't give a specific guidance on a specific year, Nigel. You know, I've, we've resisted from doing so. What we have said are two simple things, that over a three to four year period from FI21, we expect revenue growth of 25%, um, EBITDA growth of uh, between 30% to 35%. Over a three to four year period, period. There will be years when we go above, there'll be years when we go uh, below. And a new store expansion um, rate where between, say, 130 to 160 stores, which will mean that we'll double our base as of December uh, 21, uh, when we had 550 stores. So this is the broad guidance that I'd like to give and continue to give. On Sri Lanka, uh, we've not reduced exposure out of, uh, you know, any uh, purpose that we have had. It's just because the, the rupee has, has the Sri Lankan rupee has depreciated versus the Indian rupee, and therefore yeah. you are seeing this um, a significantly lower contribution to our EBITDA. The business there continues to do well. We just opened our hundred Pizza Hut store. Mm. I was there for that launch. Things are stabilizing in the country, but still, I would say, critical out of ICU um, in a normal hospital ward, but uh, you know, but but stable. Okay. But the business is absolutely fantastic. We've opened a, a seventh Taco Bell store, doing well. Okay, I'm sure. I mean, in, in such a tough market like Sri Lanka, right? Not just with the way the currency has panned out, but the whole political situation there, uh, the uh, the energy crisis there. I mean, it's it's great that the business is stable for you. Uh, you know, just a larger question. I'm sure this is a group level decision, so you may not uh, be able to comment entirely. But still, your thoughts. Um, does it make sense at any point to either sell or merge with Devyani International? I mean, both the companies, you know, have the same brands. They do the same work. Of course, different franchises. Just trying to understand that what's the point of sort of having two different entities? So that's really a decision that the franchisor Yum took six, seven years ago when they were looking at consolidate, consolidating eight different franchises. At that point in time, they could have um, given it to one franchisee. They chose to, at that time, to, um, uh, you know, look at another franchisee. And that's how Safar Foods came into existence. Right. When we came into existence, our aspiration was, how can we be the best restaurant operator in the uh, country? We started off with KFC and Pizza Hut. We will become a platform play. So some point in time in the future, perhaps add a third brand. I think right now the trajectories are different. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think it's perfectly all right. Both, um, I think both the companies work closely together um, and with uh, uh, Yum, we drive business together. So I, I think it's a perfect situation if you ask me. Right. So, you know, got that. Uh, so, that's a decision uh, for, uh, I mean, a larger decision, which perhaps uh, we'll see. Uh, another question, which, again, I mean, maybe... It's a, sorry, Prashant. Yeah, it's a decision right. even in our hands. So, we choose to also be yes, independent. Yes, so there's, no, yes. there's no decision that needs to be made at a group level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just want to... No, no, absolutely, absolutely. Point again. Uh, just one more point. I mean, and again, this question perhaps is better addressed to investors, but we have you on, so I'm, I'm going to ask this. This is the pre-IPO investors, right? The lock-in for who I think uh, finishes uh, now. I mean, it's almost uh, going to be a year. Uh, and they collectively own just under 20% in the company. Uh, have you uh, sort of had... This, I'm sure that, you know, investor calls and regular interactions with your large investors... Uh, you get a sense of uh, how they're thinking and feeling about the business. Anything you can share with us? Yes, of course. 
So at the IPO stage, we had restructured our shareholder base and therefore 52% is promoter and promoter holding. They have just come into the business, so there is absolutely no pressure to sell. 28% was on offer at the time of um, uh, the IPO, so that makes it about 78%. This is in the hands of public. There was about a 4 to 6% block that one of our investors sold about um, a couple of months ago. So that's also now public. So that's about 34. About 4% is with uh, uh, employees. So that leaves about 10, 12% in the hands of perhaps two investors who have been with us um, ever since uh, Sapphire Foods was founded. Now, uh, I, you know, uh, uh, if you ask uh, most of them um, from the way that the business is performing, I'm sure they will take the right kind of calls. But the extent of uh, even um, share, even uh, shares that could be available post November 18th when we had our IPO, in my mind, is a uh, small, uh, you know, sum of shares. Uh, Sanjay, what about the promoter entity? That's PE owned as well. They, they, yes. they intend to continue, right? Because that's the other overhang that some part of the street talks about, that this is PE on the other company that's listed. It's not PE on, so that's why they're getting a higher multiple. There's a big uh, difference in the market capitalization, so I ask you this. Yeah, so the uh, I think there is a general lack of understanding of how uh, private equity operates. Many of the people who came in um, at the time of the IPO, they've just come in and therefore they've got a much larger window of, uh, you know, opportunity to uh, stay in the company. Uh, there is a portion of this equity that is locked in perpetuity. Yes. Uh, with an, uh, because of an agreement with Young. So 25.1% yes. of this 52 is locked into perpetuity. So private equity not necessarily needs to be able to sell over a short period or a medium period of time. Yes. There are, today, there are private equity companies that are taking calls over a much longer duration because really that is when true value Got and it. exponential value is unlocked in the, uh, you know, India market. Got it, Sanjay. You know, sometimes we, it's clarification that's required from the, you know, from the one that's running the company. In this case, it's you. So I ask you that question. As you said, half of the holding of the promoter entity is, uh, you know, going to be held till perpetuity. Thanks so much for clarifying, uh, just, giving us a view. Is, yeah. is that number, Sanjay, you said the, uh, available for share, according to you, that's about 12%. Is that is yes. that the number? Yes. And... Out of that, yeah. I, mean, I would be surprised if, uh, I mean, I don't want to put a number, but, uh, yeah. but, but you were about to, but you were about to, so you're welcome to. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I'm given a yeah. choice, I'm sure people would Hold. love to stay in the company. There are some, uh, some funds which, have, which will have some amount of pressure to say that there is a fund life and yes. they've got yes. Yes. They've been with us for seven years, yes. Prashant. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the fund life, uh, it's uh, sometimes it's technical in nature and those sort of things. So, so thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us, Sanjay. It's uh, a pleasure. Good luck with the business and great chat as always. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant, Nigel, and Sonia. Lovely to chat with you all. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. All right, we'll take a very quick break here. On the other side, we'll be joined by the managements of Indigo Paints and Mahindra Life Spaces. Both reported numbers. Indigo Paints saw a very large rally yesterday, and Mahindra Life, uh, of course, reported a later, little later in the day. Uh, so those conversations coming right up.